Good evening. In 1982, the Sky at Night program was 25 years old, and we did a special program that you may remember, and we went round the world. And one observatory we visited was Siding Spring in New South Wales, Australia. And there, the largest telescope is the 153-inch reflector known as the Anglo-Australian Telescope, or AAT. Not the world's largest telescope, but certainly among the very best. And among other things, it's used for photography. The photographic scientist at Siding Spring is David Malin, and we are delighted to have him back with us once more on the program. Welcome to the Sky at Night, David. Thank you. You know, it's been said recently that photography is going out and is being replaced by electronic devices, but that's not the full story, is it? No, it isn't. Photography has many advantages, advantages which still make it useful in, in a modern observatory. I think I can perhaps show you an example. The Helix Nebula, for example, is a very large nebula, and it can't be photographed on the electronic detectors that we have today. They're too small to get it all in. Well, I know that over at Siding Spring, you've been developing entirely new processes, and you're now bringing out information that wasn't available before. What, for example, about your hypersensitizing techniques? Yes, hypersensitizing is a very important part of, of any modern photographic laboratory. Uh, they, uh, the techniques increase the speed of the photographic materials, so they remain useful in astronomy. Uh, by, exp by baking the plates in a, in a flow of nitrogen gas, for example, and following them by a dose of hydrogen gas, one can increase the speed by a factor of 20 or so. Could you give us an example of that? Yes, uh, I have a picture here of the uh, Eta Carina Nebula. In fact, two pictures. Both, pictures of those, both these pictures are identical in every respect. The exposure time was the same, telescope was the same, and the emulsion type was the same. The only difference was that one of these emulsions was hypersensitized and one wasn't. And very clearly, one goes much deeper than the other. The difference is quite incredible. But how do you start getting the information out of pictures of that kind? Well, information is the, the right word. These plates are sources of information. They're not merely pictures. And there are a variety of methods of extracting information from photographic plates. Uh, the plates used in astronomy are rather more difficult than usual because they're extremely contrasty. And they're contrasty because the objects we photograph are very faint and sit against the, the night sky background. But of course, there is always a certain amount of background. I've been to Siding Spring, and the sky there is pretty dark. It's darker than Panama, for example. But there is always a certain amount of sky glow. And I know that you've been developing various methods to get round that problem. What, for example, about unsharp masking? Yes, the unsharp masking technique overcomes, to a large extent, the high contrast properties of some of the photographic plates. And this is a, a contact printing process which uses very simple techniques to explore the very high densities that one obtains in modern photographic plates. Uh, we have a picture of the Lagoon Nebula. This plate was made on, on the UK Schmidt telescope and has been enlarged as you would enlarge a normal negative in a normal enlarger. As you see, it's rather uninformative. It's a kind of soot and whitewash thing. But if this particular image is treated by the unsharp masking process, much more is revealed. And you can see now uh, dust clouds and nebula and uh, features that were quite invisible before. How do you go about it? It's a contact copying process. involves making an unsharp positive, hence the name, unsharp masking, an unsharp positive of the original plate. Uh, once this has been made, the, print is, the plate is then printed through it, a contact copy in the normal way, and the unsharp positive takes away much of the dynamic range of the plate, revealing the faint information, the fine details that we saw before. And you can, in fact, in that way, record very faint objects. Um, I think you were clusters of external galaxies. Yes, a slightly different process is used for this. It's called photographic amplification. That, too, is a contact printing process, and it works by enlarging the grains, the silver grains, which comprise the photographic image. Uh, a picture here of the Centaurus cluster, uh, only visible in the southern sky. This is the view of the plate if you held it over a light table and inspected it in the normal way. When you apply the photographic amplification process to this, much more detail is revealed, and very excitingly, a long, thin jet, which points to the, to the main galaxy in the, in the uh, field, which is, in fact, an X-ray source. Now, what about the um, actual colour phot photographic processes? When we first started uh, to want to have some colour pictures, we used ordinary colour film, and these rapidly proved to be unsuccessful for a, a wide variety of reasons. Why was that? Well, colour films aren't designed to photograph astronomical nebulae. They're very good for stars and continuous objects, objects with continuous spectra. But in nebula, we find we have very narrow emission lines. And colour films aren't really ideal for that. They, they, are, they see the, uh, the colours in a rather unbalanced fashion. Does that also apply to certain light sources on, on the Earth's surface, some kinds of artificial lights, for example? If you photograph fluorescent lights with an ordinary film in an ordinary camera, or even some kinds of mercury street lights, they turn out to be astonishing, an astonishing green colour. A picture of the Sydney Harbour Bridge shows this very well, because if you stand there and look at this scene, these street lights look perfectly normal, slightly pinkish, but not, certainly not uh, in any way unbalanced. But this colour picture shows that the colour film sees them in a rather curious fashion and produces this terrible green cast. Yes, I can see that very clearly. But of course, in fact, therefore, in astronomy, actual colour film can give rather misleading results. Yes, quite false results, in fact. 
um, for, for, for nebula, uh, the color film doesn't see the green line, which is, which is due to ionized oxygen at all. It sees very strongly only the red line. So nebulae always appear to be too red when they're photographed on color film. How do you get around that? We now take our color pictures using black and white plates. This gives us some tremendous advantages. In particular, we can hypersensitize our, hyper our plates, so it makes very efficient use uh, of the telescope time. And we can also incorporate into the process the three, the um, uh, uh, unsharp masking and photographic amplification process as well. Well, let's have a look at some examples. And I'm thinking of those magnificent pictures you've taken of the Rho Ophiuchi area in the Milky Way. Yes, this is a beautiful part of the sky, uh, but it's full of very faint nebulae. This picture was taken with ordinary color film using the UK Schmidt telescope and shows at lower right uh, the red supergiant Antares and uh, uh, above it a very distant globular cluster, Messier 4, and lots of wisps of nebulosity covering the field. When this same field was re-photographed using three black and white plates and the pictures combined to make a colour photograph, this is what was revealed. It's exactly the same field, much, much fainter. Now, what about the actual scientific value of these as opposed to the aesthetic value? Our initial approach was to produce some colour pictures for publicity purposes. But it soon became apparent, as we built into the colour process the black and white uh, methods I mentioned to you, that we were able to make meaningful pictures which had real scientific content. What, for example, about, shall we say, dust content in the various galaxies? Dust uh, occurs in, in, in all galaxies. It's very hard to detect. But it has some very distinctive colour properties. For example, if you see dust silhouetted against sky, as you do in this new colour picture of the Large Magellanic Cloud, the dust blobs are a distinct yellow colour. And the places in this galaxy where there are stars apparently missing are, in fact, is where, where, where dust is. And you can see it's dust because it has a distinctly yellow hue. David, we've seen um, quite a bit of your photography and we've heard some of your techniques, but I think that everyone would like to see a whole series of your latest plates taken with the AAT and the, the other main instrument at Siding Spring, the UK Schmidt. We looked a few minutes ago at the Large Magellanic Cloud, and in part the Anglo-Australian Telescope was put where it is because the Magellanic Cloud is there to be studied. A very important nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud is the Tarantula Nebula. It's extremely bright, full of many, many stars, and here you can see clearly the, the yellowing effect of dust against this, uh, this nebulosity. Each one of the white spots on that photograph is a star. Many of those stars are recently formed, and they've recently formed in that nebulosity. Uh, because the stars are forming, dust is also present, and many, many areas of yellow dust can be seen in this field, which are not detectable when you look at this kind of field in, uh, ordinary black, with ordinary black and white photographs. Um, interstellar dust is very important in our galaxy. It changes the colour of many of the objects that we have uh, in, in the sky. If I show you a picture now of a pair of nebulae in Carina, for example, these two appear to be side by side in the sky. And when I made this colour picture first of all, I was very surprised to find that the one on the left, which is called NGC 3603, is a distinctly different colour mm. from 3657 uh, on the right. And it wasn't until I went to the literature and looked uh, at these objects to find out, what, find out what I knew about them that I discovered that the one on the left is three times further away than the one on the right. And in fact, the colour change is due to dust, dust, dust particles in our galaxy obscuring the blue light from that, uh, that nebulosity. Uh, these, these two nebulae are in the constellation of Carina. And this constellation stretches across the southern Milky Way. Here we see a very wide-angle picture of, of uh, Crux and a Carina. On the left-hand side is the Southern Cross, a distinct kite-shaped group of stars sitting above a, a, dust, a, a dusty patch, the Southern Cross. And if we scan across through to the right-hand side of the picture, we see very many open clusters, which are uh, uh, very distinctive in the uh, spiral arms of the Milky Way. And the red blob there is the wonderful Eta Carina Nebula, which in fact is a naked eye object. Uh, we can have a look at one of these uh, open clusters. This is uh, NGC uh, 3692 in Carina. It's a young cluster of stars recently formed, uh, but one of them has evolved much more quickly than the others and appears there as a, a red giant, or rather an, an orange star. Again, an example of the way in which colour photographs can be used to pick out uh, individual objects. Uh, but the most striking thing in that part of the sky is the Eta Carina Nebula itself. This is a picture taken from plates made on the UK Schmidt telescope. At the heart of this nebula is a very peculiar star indeed. It's the star Eta Carina. We see it in this picture at lower right, uh, a curious blob-like object, which is in fact a star hidden inside a nebula, a nebula that the star itself has created. This peculiar star is losing substantial amounts of its mass, and as it does so, it hides itself in a cocoon and has dimmed considerably over the last 140 years. 
when Herschel observed this star in 1840, he described it as one of the brightest in the sky, second or third brightest. And now it's faded to below visibility to seventh or eighth magnitude. And in doing so, it's also taken with it part of the keyhole nebula stretched across the top of that picture. Uh, that part of that nebula is now not visible because the star is fading inside its cocoon. Stars like this are, are rare in our galaxy, but there are other examples of stars losing substantial amounts of their mass. Uh, this one is, um, is a, a very massive star which is throwing off part of its outer layers and producing this curious bilobe nebula that you see here. Right at the heart of this nebula, you can see the very blue and very hot star. Outside our galaxy in the Large Magellanic Cloud, these stars do tend to congregate in groups. And there, their enormously energetic stellar winds blow away from them the hydrogen gas from w which surrounds them and produce these lovely uh, bubble nebulae. In fact, the velocities of the stellar winds leaving the surfaces of these stars approach uh, velocities of 4,000 kilometers a second, which is absolutely astonishing speed for uh, material leaving the surface of a star. Um, my pictures also are able to show uh, the colours of star. In fact, we've recently produced a book on that very topic. Here we see a galaxy, NGC 6822, a galaxy of the local group, a galaxy which is resolved on the Anglo-Australian telescope into individual stars. And if we take a closer look at this galaxy, part of the lower corner, we can see the individual colours of stars showing the two separate populations of stars. Yellow stars formed a long time ago, uh, and superimposed on that are many blue stars scattered across the field. These are young stars formed quite recently from the gas uh, of which this galaxy is, is very rich. What about the spiral nebulae, which after all are among the most magnificent sights in the sky? Yes, well, we live inside a spiral nebulae, and if we could take the Anglo-Australian telescope 30 million light years away and look back, we'd see a galaxy of this kind. We live in one of the spiral arms surrounded by bluish stars, and indeed you can see the spiral arms in this galaxy are composed of blue stars. Dotted along the spiral arms are the red blobs, the emission regions we saw in close-up earlier on in this, in this sequence of pictures. And towards the centre of our galaxy, there are very many very yellow stars uh, hiding in the nucleus. Because we can't see the centre of our galaxy with there's too much dust in the way. No, but when we look towards the centre of our galaxy, we do see some yellow stars and we do see some dust. Uh, the Milky Way is, is uh, divided by a band of dust running across this, this photograph. This is, again, is a wide-angle picture which shows the centre of the galaxy. And again, the red blobs are, are ne nebulae and um, uh, sites of star formation. The most prominent nebula there is, in fact, the Lagoon Nebula, which in close-up in our next picture looks like this. We've already seen it in black and white uh, in an unsharp masked version. And these three plates that went to make this colour picture have also been unsharp masked to reveal detail into the heart of the Lagoon Nebula. Nearby in the sky is the Triffid Nebula. Uh, it has another feature which is really very interesting and enjoyable. Uh, it has a blue reflection nebula associated with it. In the heart of the Triffid are a group of uh, extremely hot stars recently formed there, and these are the stars which energise all of that nebula. Around its outside there's an enormous reflection nebula, uh, particles of gas and dust which scatter light, blue light from those stars and produce this rather remarkable photograph here. Uh, reflection nebulae are some of the most beautiful objects in our, in our galaxy. This one is near Orion. It's got, only got a catalogue name, NGC 1977. And in any other part of the sky, it will be a remarkable object. But it happens to live very near the Orion Nebula and tends to be overlooked. But I think you'll agree it's rather beautiful. It really is a magnificent, magnificent sight. Uh, the Pleiades, too, are, uh, are a group of stars in the Northern Hemisphere surrounded by reflection nebula. And this is a new picture made from UK Schmidt plates uh, which shows that this nebulosity extends over much further than was previously expected. Well, of course, the Pleiades do make a, a very brave showing in our sky during the evenings throughout most of the autumn and winter. You can see about seven individual stars with the naked eye, but you certainly can't see that lovely reflection nebula without photography with a large telescope. And that picture does show it more deeply than any I've seen previously. Yes, yes. Um, nebulae are, come in all kinds, of course, and one of the most prominent emission nebulae are, are those in Orion. Um, these, these are equatorial objects in a sense, they can be seen equally from the north and, and southern hemisphere. And this is a close-up of the heart of the Orion Nebula, showing a small group of stars called the trapezium stars, which provide most of the energy for producing the colours in this gas. If we take a slightly wider view, uh, these are very short exposures, by the way, plates taken on the Anglo-Australian telescope, only five-minute exposures, because this is a, a very bright nebula. We see much more of the nebulosity. It has this kind of streaming effect, as though it's been blowing out from the... Uh, trapezium stars, and indeed that is the case. But if you take a very deep picture, uh, a wide-angle view again of the Orion Nebula, you see uh, an enormous amount of nebulosity. And quite interestingly, 
uh, the scientific use of a photograph of this kind shows that the distinct red colour exists as a sphere to the lower left of the brightest part of the nebula. And there are good scientific reasons why that is a really very interesting observation indeed. Now, quite near Orion in the sky is the Horsehead Nebula. This is a, a classical astronomical picture. Um, it, it contains uh, an object which is very distinctive, is very well known. And if we look, take a closer look at this, a, a photograph taken on the Anglo-Australian telescope, we can see details that have not previously been seen. Some, de some little squiggly things right down the bottom of the picture there, which are indicative of star formation in that part of the sky. It's amazing, isn't it, really, that there's no basic difference between a dark nebula and a bright one. It's simply that the bright nebula has got suitable stars mixed in it or very close to it to make it radiate. Yes, our galaxy is full of dark nebula. Uh, those that have stars in them produce the pictures that you've seen here now. David, you've taken a great many pictures now from Siding Spring. If I asked you to select the picture that has given you most pleasure, which you regard as your most memorable, which would you select? I think it would have to be my photograph of Barnard 86. It's not the most spectacular picture when you first see it, but it has some wonderful features. It sums up an awful lot about uh, astronomy. Uh, this picture shows a small section of the Milky Way, perhaps an area only about half the size of the full moon. All the white blobs in the background are stars in our own galaxy. The brighter ones are an open cluster. New, recent stars formed in this very tight group, and they show clear colour differences. Those colour differences uh, tell you a lot about the way in which stars evolve and uh, gives, give indications of their, of their future activity. Also in this field, there is a, a dark hole. When these dark holes were first seen by the early astronomers, they thought they were voids through which they could peer to the, to the universe beyond our Milky Way. But we now, we now know that these are dust, and by looking at this colour picture, you can see that this dark cloud has a red edge. And if the early astronomers had either colour pictures or colour vision that was capable of seeing this, they would, they would be, there would be no confusion about it. They would realise very clearly that it was dust. Of course, there are one or two foreground stars between us and the dark cloud. Yes, indeed, there are. Uh, these stars are much nearer to us and, of course, are, are not obscured by, by that dark cloud. Well, there are plenty of dark nebulae in the sky. And, of course, the famous one is the coal sack in the Southern Cross that we saw a little while ago. But that, I think, is one of the most spectacular of all. David, we've been seeing magnificent pictures that you have taken. But, of course, it is also possible for anyone to take astronomical pictures of a kind. And, of course, I'm thinking now of star trails in particular. Star trails are very easy to take if you have a nice, dark place and a camera that you can leave outside all night with, without fear of it being moved or stolen. And when you do this, uh, you obtain a beautiful picture which shows the colour of stars as they actually move around the pole. This star trail picture was taken uh, with the dome of the Anglo-Australian Observatory in the foreground and is full of useful scientific information. Um, how many hours was that exposure? About something like 12? No, it's about 10 and a half hours, which is just about the longest time it's really dark in Australia. And there, of course, you can see the, uh, the south pole of the sky, which, unlike our own pole, is not marked by any bright star. But if you take the same kind of picture uh, from the northern hemisphere and point it at the pole star, you'll get a very short, sharp trail near the centre of the picture. Yes, yes, you do. Uh, interestingly, in, in that picture too, the centre of the pole, the centre of the rotation of the stars, is in fact your latitude. And if you take a, a, a compass or a protractor and measure the angle of, between the horizon and the centre, you can work out your latitude from that picture. David, what do you think is the future of astronomical photography? I think it has a very long future. I think it's going to go on for a long, long time to come because of the advantages I mentioned, mentioned before. But also, there are new astronomical emulsions being designed now to can continue astronomical photography and make us go ever deeper in the future. Well, I certainly could get rich upon your results, but I think these pictures you've been producing at Siding Spring are certainly the best ever taken. And we've been uh, delighted to see them this time. And next time you come over to Britain, David, um, I very much hope you'll return to the sky at night and uh, give us a preview of your very latest results. Thank you very Many much. Many congratulations. Thank you. And so, for the moment, from David and from myself and from Siding Spring, good night. You can see that edition of The Sky at Night again next no. time.